for Unit 3, you'll want to make sure you read the introduction to Chapter 1 and, and also look at Sections 1.8 and 1.9. Read those fairly thoroughly. They'll have pretty good descriptions of what it is we're going to talk about or visit about in this show. So, side note on these PowerPoint shows that you're seeing, you can actually go up backwards and forwards in the slideshow by simply hitting the Page Up or Page Down button a couple times. It will get you there. So you, you, have, you have the ability to move around inside of here if you want to. What we're going to look at in Unit 3 is matter and the transformations that it undergoes. That's really what chemistry is all about. And so we're going to take a look first at what a sort of definition of chemistry. We're going to look at the concept of physical and chemical properties. We're going to look at physical and chemical changes. We're also going to look at a way of classifying matter. Of course, the starting point, and if you're in a descriptive chemistry course, is what in the world is chemistry anyway? And it turns out chemistry we consider to be the study of matter and any of the transformations it undergoes. Well, if we're going to talk about matter, we probably ought to define what that is. And matter is simply anything that occupies space and has a mass. Okay, So if you think about it, there are very few things that would not fall into <coughs> our definition of matter, which means chemistry can be pretty much involved with just about anything whatsoever. Uh, sort of emotions and ideas and things like that don't have space, and some don't carry a whole lot of matter, <laughs> a whole lot of mass either. But, but for the most part, any material you're going to look at has some chemical aspect to it. We're going to look at a couple different types of properties of matter. If we're going to characterize matter, we want to be able to talk about how, how does it behave, what does it do, what are the characteristics of that particular matter. And so the physical property is the first place we're going to look. And we look at the physical property, it's just a property of that piece of matter on its own. So if, if physical properties don't really depend on matter interacting with any other part, <clears throat> any other type of matter whatsoever. Uh, examples of physical properties are the boiling point. If we say the water boils at 100 degrees C, that means that's, that's a physical property because it doesn't depend on what else is around. That's water's boiling point under whatever pressure that is. We can talk about the hardness of materials. We can talk about the color of materials. If you want to get a feel for the physical properties, you might want to take a look at uh, this link that you'll see on the PowerPoint. You should be able to click on it and go there. And what it is is a big periodic table, it's called Periodic Table Live, and it will allow you to play around a little bit with different types of elements. You can take, and if you go to that link, if you just click on any of the elements showing in that big periodic table to start, and then click on the physical button to the left menu once you have <laughs> clicked on the element, you'll see a whole assortment of different types of order, primarily physical properties. As I point out here, I'm not sure cost is a physical property, but it's kind of interesting to look at if you want to know what elements cost in their base state. So. It's kind of an idea that way you can get a feel for what physical properties are. The conductivity, boiling points, melting points, densities, all these types of things. When we shift and look at chemical properties, what we find in chemical properties is we're looking at how the material reacts with other types of material. So now it's not a standalone property anymore. We have to have something else involved. So um, examples here that I have are iron, rust, if we have it in moist air, hydrogen and oxygen react violently to form water, we know that, if you look at the Hindenburg, for example. Uh, neon doesn't react with much of anything, that's, that's a property, that's a chemical property, I don't react. That can be counted as a chemical property as well. If you want to feel, get a feel for what some of these chemical properties are, you might go to uh, that, also the periodic table link that I have in there, and now instead of clicking on the physical button, click on the media button, and you'll see a series of videos, that depending on which element you pick, some don't react at all with anything, so there won't be any videos, but you click on there and you should be able to see different types of what we call reactions going on. These are all evidence of chemical properties that these things have. For example, sodium reacts with acid, <coughs> so um, that's a chemical property of sodium. We have a subtle change here, and then we have physical properties and chemical properties. Also, we'll talk about physical and chemical changes, and all that means is, for example, we can say the boiling point of water is 100 degrees C. That's a physical property. If I take a sample of water and I boil it at 100 degrees C and vaporize it away, that's a physical change. So the change is actually conducting whatever that process is. We can talk about chemical changes in the same way. It's a property of sodium that will react with acids, if I take a chunk of sodium and I throw it in acid, like you see in those media shots, and those video shots, that is a chemical change. That sodium is no longer what it was before. And we'll learn more about that as we go on throughout the semester. <clears throat> and it turns out there are over 18 million characterized compounds in the world, which means there are a whole bunch more. We just don't know what they are yet. 
Uh, as a matter of fact, there's probably a virtually an infinite number we could have. But the, the classification system is important for us. We need some sort of a framework to study. You'll find scientists like to do this. We like to think, okay, we need to get everything in order so we can talk about it. Uh, this initial classification system we're going to look at provides a good starting point. It's not entirely complete, but it's a place you can get, get started with. Uh, and as you might imagine, we have subclassifications under many of these groups that we'll be looking at. So we're going to break it down as broadly as we can to start with and kind of get a sense for this. You'll find as we move along that these definitions we'll see will make a little bit more sense as we start talking about how we actually how matter is actually made out of elements and, and atoms and all that sort of thing. <clears throat> There are three common states of matter, uh, gas, liquid, and solid. If you look at some of the properties, uh, gas takes the shape of its container no matter what the container is. Gas flows pretty easily, and a gas is pretty easily compressible. Liquid, on the other hand, takes the shape of the container, but only up to a flat top. That's because of gravitational and intermolecular force concerns. If you actually <clears throat> took a, a sample of water, take a cup of water up into the space station, and throw it up in the air, you'll, for one thing, be in a lot of trouble probably, but the other thing is it'll just form a big, round, perfect sphere. It has different kinds of constraints on it at that point. A solid retains its shape, doesn't flow very well, and is not very compressible overall. And I threw in a bonus state for you. There really is a fourth state we consider called plasma, a big stream of charged particles, and this is what is in plasma TVs. So if you're watching a plasma TV, that's what you're looking at, is, is that effectively fourth state of matter. <clears throat> Here's sort of a visual description on here, and if you look at the visual description, what you'll see is the gas, liquid, and solid, and this comes from a simulation system uh, that you can get to. If you look down in the lower right-hand corner where it says fet.colorado.edu, um, you can go and play with the simulation, heat things up, you can do sorts, all sorts of things like that. Uh, on the left-hand side, notice the gas particles. Whatever those are, those might be what we call molecules, and those might be called atoms. We'll get that terminology down later. But those small particles over there are kind of flying all over inside of that container, <coughs> very far apart, moving very rapidly, they're colliding on off. off uh, they're colliding with each other very rapidly. <coughs> if you go to the middle one now, if you look at the temperatures at the top for the gas, I have it at 70 Kelvin. Kelvin is just a temperature scale. If you look at the middle one, I've got it down to 20, so I've cooled it down now. Now what you find is molecules or atoms or whatever those little particles are, are actually somehow coalescing a little bit. They're getting together. There must be some sort of an attraction between those particles. So when I slow them down enough, they can take advantage of that, and that's where we get a liquid. The particles are pretty close together, move pretty slowly. They're more ordered, but they're not as ordered as much as what a solid is. A, a liquid is not very compressible. If I go to the gas on the left, I can take and squeeze down on that piston, and those particles will get closer. I can move that piston a lot. If I take the piston in the middle on the liquid, if I move it all the way down so it's just touching those molecules, those particles, and try to squeeze it more, it won't squeeze very much because I don't have much free space in it anymore at all. And then if I take and cool it down even further, it looks like 9 Kelvin over in the one on the right. That's a solid. All the particles are organized, very well organized. They're vibrating a little bit, but they don't change location very much at all. So as we move the temperature down, the particles kind of get closer. They start being attracted more to each other. <clears throat> so we have gas, liquid, solid. We go for a little further, we talk about pure substances and compounds, how we distinguish between those. A pure substance has a definite fixed composition that doesn't vary from one sample to the other. So I can have pure copper, I can have pure water. <clears throat> if I have pure water, it's always got the same form. It's always got the same composition no matter what. If I have a mixture, I can have a variable composition. It can be different from one sample to another. And you can put different amounts in. Think about salt water. I could put different amounts of salt into my water, and I'd have different compositions inside of there. It's a mixture. Uh, think of sort of a classic example. If I have hydrogen and oxygen inside of a balloon, those are both gases. Uh, I can put them in any kind of ratio I want to. If I take and I light the balloon off with a match, I'll actually form water. In the end, the water will have a fixed composition, no matter what the starting composition was, and that water is going to be a pure substance. Now, I'll have extra hydrogen or extra oxygen left over, but I will have formed a pure substance water, and the other stuff is gases and just goes up in the air. A little bit further classification, when I think about pure substances, I can break those into either elements or compounds. An element basically is a substance which you cannot break into simpler substances by any kind of a chemical process. Now, 
if you take a look at that periodic chart you saw earlier, it had all those different elements on it on that link that I gave you. Uh, if you look at that, that's that's a listing of the elements. Those things are elements. If it's not on that chart, as long as it's a current chart, if it's not on that chart, that's going to be an element. If I take the elements and then I combine them together, I make things called compounds. This is actually a chemical combination. If we go back to hydrogen and oxygen in a balloon, when I start out, hydrogen is an element, oxygen is an element. When I light it off with a match, and I make water, which is a chemical combination of hydrogen and oxygen, I've taken two elements and I've made the compound water out of those elements. <coughs> so here's a full-blown periodic table. Uh, it's a little bit behind, probably. It's hard to keep up anymore. We're about up to element 118. Uh, and that's, that's the entire set that we find in the universe. As a matter of fact, many of those are man-made. They aren't even found in the universe. They're, we make them on our own. We don't do much with them other than study them and see what they could do. So the periodic chart is going to be a large part of what we do. You might think the periodic chart is kind of like the chemist's cheat sheet. It has everything on it we need to know. This one's a little bare, but, but it has lots of information available on it, just based on where elements are on that chart, even. And then, so the pure substances, we can break in elements and compounds. The mixtures, we can take and break into being either homogeneous or heterogeneous. Homogeneous means the same. Think about homogenized milk, where they've taken and put it all into one sort of one phase looking thing. It used to be in the old days, I hear, that the, the part of the milk would separate out, but the homogenization now makes it all a uniform uh, <coughs> mixture all the way through. Uh, sugar dissolved in water is a homogeneous mixture. Put a little bit of salt in water, that's a homogeneous mixture. Air is a homogeneous mixture. It's got oxygen, it's got nitrogen in it. A heterogeneous mixture, the appearance is not the same all the way through. So if I put sand in water, I can see there's sand sitting in the bottom of water. I know it's a mixture because there's two different things in it. And it's heterogeneous because I can see the differences. Oil and water is the same kind of thing. If I look at uh, air again, air is a homogeneous mixture. If you look at smog, that's really a lot of it's a heterogeneous mixture, kind of heavy particles hanging in the air. In summary... Uh, this classification system that may be helpful to you looks something like this. We basically take all of matter up at the top. First, ask ourselves the question, is it a pure substance or is it a mixture? If it's a pure substance, that means it could be either an element or it could be a compound. If it's a mixture, it can be classified then as a homogeneous or a heterogeneous mixture. After having viewed the slideshow, you'll want to go and work on the self-assessment for Unit 3. This will be covered in one of the upcoming quizzes. Check the syllabus for the date to make sure that you know when that is.